five and everything, and over here, it's not like that, you know, and I see how it really is, you know. Like in Yonkers High, like, you know, like I would ask teachers about college and stuff, but they didn't really, you know, they didn't tell you that much. And like the guidance concept would be the same thing. It's like, well, you only need this to graduate. Don't worry about, you know, getting extra credits and stuff. And over here, it's different, you know. And like there's more competition, and you know, I see that now. <laughs> year here, I expected to get beat up. I really did. <laughs> I'm serious, because the first year, my brother told me about all the people that went to school, the Italians or anything. I'm not prejudiced or anything, but I was really scared. But nobody ever said anything to me. They Remember the like, first time when we hit, they threw eggs at the bus? Yeah, oh, God. And that big fight. The bus fight. driver, he got out the bus, and he started choking so, the kid. He said, don't do that again. Oh, yeah. The girls were troublemakers. They really were, because mm -hmm. I know my friends. I, I'd be in the front with my friends, and they'd be like, hey. Oh, this white girl. Come on. I'd be like, come on, man. <laughs> Ignorant people. <laughs> Everyone was stereotyping too much. I think the kids from Yonkers side, most of them thought that you know, everybody over here was rich white snobs, and the kids over here thought they were all, you know, poor little people who lived in slums and everything. It was too much stereotyping. It's just a habit. That's why, like, people like different races always have to, you know, they feel more binding toward their groups. Yeah, so. You know, usually they have a negative attitude toward the other group because they always feel theirs is so better. So what do you do when, when times come about when you're not only with your group? I mean, you're going to have to face well, time. It also takes, oh. takes time getting used to it. And as soon as everybody got used to it, it was fine. No bullet wounds or anything. Yeah. I'm all right. <laughs> The first step in desegregating the school system appears to have gone relatively smoothly. But the other part of the court order faces deepening resistance. No one wants low-income housing in their neighborhood. This is School 15. This is a site proposed by the NAACP and the Justice Department to one of the three sites proposed to settle the uh, integration lawsuit. As you can see, it's in the middle of a one-family middle-class neighborhood. They propose to build 100 units here. It means problems. What happened here was we were sued because all the low-income housing was placed on the west side. It was placed on the west side because that's where it was needed. There were tenements there. People were living in, in hovels. Cold so we flats. Cold water flats. They tore them down and they put someplace nice for them to live. And now they're saying, they're not saying to us, thanks for giving us some place to live. They're saying, why can't we live where you live? Well, because you didn't work hard enough. Go get a job and work hard enough and then come and live where I live. Save Yonkers Federation is a coalition of 24 neighborhood groups fighting the court order. Tonight, the officers meet. Projects were built in Southwest Yonkers, predominantly for the whites. The minorities moved in. And I'm not saying it was only the minorities that caused the problems. But when you build a brand new building, and within the first two or three weeks that it's open, you have elevator fires, lobby fires, graffiti over the walls, or all around the walls. I don't want that in my neighborhood. This is the Riverview Housing Project in Southwest Yonkers. It was built and opened in 1975. It demonstrates in its concentration the kind of housing we don't want to build as part of the remedy. We're trying to get low density, low and moderate income housing in, on locations in East Yonkers. We want enough locations so that at any given location we only need 50, 75, 100 units at the most, not the kind of high rise density you see here. I think the objection of the people on the east side is not that um, they don't want a minority living next door to them. Uh, it's the fact that they don't want low-income housing anymore. We, we have our share. I live with blacks. I delivered newspapers to blacks. But I can't live next to what the government has in these projects. If the government wants to put criminals, dope pushers and things into the projects, I can't live next to them. Federal judge find me guilty. The Court of Appeals can find me guilty. The Supreme Court. But if they think they're going to integrate with Jack Tracy and his family, they're going to have to build projects 60 miles, 80 miles north. It may be in Maine or Vermont in the woods. They can build them wherever they want. 
And if it means Canada or even going back to Ireland, I will not live next to a project. That is not why my father was in the war. I was in the Korean War. My brother was in Vietnam. That ain't why I'm living in this country. I don't think the judge ruled against us because he was going to rule that way. I think he did it on the basis of the information and the testimony that was given. And I think we had to change. I think we had to bring Yonkers into the new era. And whether it's by court order or what, I think we're, we're doing that. Um, the one thing I think is, is tough for Yonkers to take and swallow, because it happened, they said, well, for 40 years. All of a sudden now we're being, we're here today and getting painted by all of this that happened 40 years ago and 35 years ago. How should we correct injustices that are rooted in events long past? It's a question that involves crucial aspects of our lives. In Yonkers, the struggle is over housing and schools. But let's take a look for a moment at another aspect of the problem. Equality is still the issue. But in San Francisco, the controversy is about jobs. Well, my first idea was to work on the Golden Gate Bridge. I wanted to be the person who worked at the very top of the tower, sandblasting and painting. My second idea was to become a firefighter. Chris Barr has been training since she took the test to be a San Francisco firefighter in 1982. She and several other women filed suit against the city, charging discriminatory hiring practices. I wanted to do something that would challenge me. I was just finishing graduate school, and a friend of mine had a brother who was a firefighter, and he said, can you lift 150 pounds? And I said, yeah. He says, well, you can be a firefighter. And I didn't ever think that there were no women firefighters because I didn't know. I, I thought that it was an option for me. So I went to the federal building and asked about the Golden Gate Bridge, and they said, oh, we're not going to be hiring for years. So I said, well, geez, I guess I should pursue the fire department. Little did I know it was going to take five years for the fire department to get going. You would think, wouldn't you, in this day and age, that virtually everyone would agree there's no excuse for job discrimination. That no matter what your race or your sex, if you're qualified, you get the job. Here in San Francisco, for almost 20 years, the fire department has been in and out of court, charged repeatedly with discrimination in its hiring and promotion policies, discrimination against minorities, and now discrimination against women. San Francisco, like a lot of other places, is trying to figure out what is fair, what does equal mean under the Constitution. 